If faith and reason are discussed today in the media, it's often in the context of a new atheist proclaiming that science is the only means of finding reliable knowledge. Any claim to knowledge beyond the natural sciences is seen as questionable or suspect. As Peter Atkins puts it in his recent book, On Being, the scientific method is the only means of discovering the nature of reality, the only way of acquiring reliable knowledge. This thesis is summed up well by the philosopher Worrell. Everything that we can legitimately claim to know about the world is based on the methods and rules of evidence employed in science. As Dawkins declares, the presence or absence of a creative superintelligence is unequivocally a scientific question. The methods we should use to settle the matter would be purely and entirely scientific methods, and religious faith is a persistent false belief held in the face of a strong contradictory evidence. In fact, from reading these authors, you can get the impression that reason and religion occupy two very different worlds, two very different planets. The planet of evidence-based knowledge, occupied by the scientists, and the world of blind faith, enthusiasm, mysticism, and never the two shall meet. But how representative is this angle on faith and reason of other historical periods? Well, it's certainly not representative of classical Christian thought. As Thomas Williams argues, the great medieval thinkers would all have been bewildered by the idea, widespread in contemporary culture, that faith and reason are fundamentally at odds. Though their philosophical outlooks varied widely, they were in general agreement that philosophical reasoning could and should be used to defend and elucidate the doctrines of the Christian faith. Now it goes without saying that this question is all about definition. How we define and conceive of faith on the one side and what we associate with reason on the other. For example, how we think of human rationality will make all the difference to how we think of the relationship between faith and reason. For example, when we look back at Augustine, Anselm or Aquinas, we see a very different picture. This classical Christian thought had inherited a philosophical outlook very different to what dominates the popular debate today. For Augustine, this was a philosophy with its origins in Plato's thought, known as Neoplatonism, and at the time associated with a philosopher named Plotinus. This Neoplatonism was the dominant philosophical atmosphere Augustine breathed, and understandably this permeated much of his thought. In looking at Platonic philosophies, one of the first things that gets discussed is dualism. That involves a contrast between the shadowy material world of our sense experience that we inhabit and an immaterial, eternal realm of ideals which are grasped with the mind. Any true or permanent knowledge cannot be found in exploring the world around us, but can only be found through our mind's eye concentrating on those eternal truths and immaterial ideals. In occupying this world of shadows, it's easy to see this as reality and not to move beyond it in our understanding. The most famous expression of this human condition is Plato's analogy of the cave. He asks us to imagine people who have forever been imprisoned below ground and think that what they witness in that cave is all there is, until eventually one person escapes to experience the full light of the real world. Consequently, for this philosophy, the material world of our senses is like living in that cave, where what knowledge we had is that of shadows. In order to see what is real, true, eternal, we need to be freed, move beyond the world of our bodily senses, and perceive with our minds eternal, immaterial ideals and truths. Thus, when we leave the world of our material senses, we are initially dazzled by the light of that truth. Now there are many ways in which Augustine, the theologian, would question the Neoplatonism that had such an impression on him. But generally speaking, that philosophical picture remains. In fact, 
Augustine, various places, talks about a vision of God that he's had. And when you read those visions, it sounds very much like someone leaving Plato's cave and glimpsing some eternal truth. For example, in his vision of God in Book 7 of the Confessions, he writes, Having been admonished by the Platonist books to return into myself, I entered into my innermost self. With you, God, as my guide, I entered, and with whatever sort of eye it is that my soul possesses, I saw above with that same eye of my soul an immutable light. And shining intensely on me, you shocked the weakness of my sight, and I trembled with love and awe, and there was absolutely no room left for doubt. So for Augustine, coming to know the truth was not primarily focused on our bodily senses, but was all about the divine illumination of our minds. Something he recognised that the Platonic philosophers had glimpsed. So for this tradition, there is not that conflict between faith and reason, theology and philosophy. The ultimate truth that the theologian and philosopher are looking for within this tradition look remarkably similar. For the Augustinian tradition, faith is seeking this kind of understanding and is not at odds with it. So the kind of opposition we hear about today with regard to faith and reason is quite foreign to this classical Christianity. The crucial difference between the philosopher and the Christian is not in the truth they hope to behold, but in their approach to that truth. The philosopher, according to Augustine, is full of pride in their ability to come to that vision unaided, where the Christian comes in humility to God. Here, faith helps those who are not able with their minds to see this other world. Rather, they believe based on the authority of the church and its tradition of witness. There are certain ones, however, who think themselves capable by their own strength of being purified, so as to contemplate and to inhere in God, whose very pride defiles them above all others, for they promise a purification of themselves by their own power, because some of them have been able to send their mind's eye travelling beyond all created things, and to touch, though it be ever so small a part, the light of the unchangeable truth while many Christians, as they mockingly assert, who live in the meantime by faith alone, have not yet been able to do so. But what harm is it for a humble man if he cannot see it from so great a distance, but yet is coming to it on the wood, by which the other does not deign to be carried? This passage locates both Christian and Platonist as seeking the same goal, a final and enduring contemplation of an existence in divine truth. But this ascent towards contemplation is understood by Augustine to be facilitated for the Christian by acceptance and humility of the need to be carried on the wood, a term which symbolises both church and the cross, towards a goal that he or she may not even have grasped as yet. Now, extending the analogy of the cave may be one way to develop this point. At the end of Plato's analogy, there's an interesting passage where Plato contemplates what would happen if the person who'd been freed from the darkness returned to communicate with those who are still in the cave. He says, Consider this too. If this man went down into the cave again and sat down in his same seat, wouldn't his eyes come suddenly out of the sunlight, like that be filled with darkness? Wouldn't it be said of him that he'd returned from his outward journey with his eyesight ruined, and that it isn't worthwhile even to try to travel upwards? And as for anyone who tried to free them and lead them upwards, if they could somehow get their hands on him, wouldn't they kill him? Now it's easy to see the death of Socrates in these terms, but for Augustine, is this not the task of the church to lead people out of darkness into that marvellous light? But until they see the light, their progress will be by faith in those leading them, not by sight, as Augustine can say in his early writings. Faith may be called that which resists the senses and believes that the world of the mind is better. All of this is summed up nicely in the advice he gives. There is only one prescription I can give you, I know no other. You must entirely flee from things of sense. 
So long as we bear this body, we must beware lest our wings are hindered. We need sound and perfect wings if we are to fly from this darkness to yonder light, which does not deign to manifest itself to men shut up in a cave, unless they can escape, leaving sensible things broken and dissolved. But how do we get from that classical synthesis that we've seen to the kind of opposition between faith and reason we witness today? Well, it's a very, very complex story, and there are a number of different ways of telling it. Some would say, with the new influence of Aristotle's work in the high Middle Ages on the West, on someone like Aquinas, that rather than starting with divine illumination from above, as far as knowledge is concerned, there's a beginning from below, working from the world around us, upwards from that. Others would say the classical synthesis between faith and reason was pulled apart by someone like William of Ockham. But however we tell the story, there's no doubt that we enter a very different thought world when you come across someone like John Locke at the beginning of the Enlightenment. A thought world which would be very unfamiliar to someone like Augustine, but far more familiar for us today. In his groundbreaking book on human understanding, John Locke admires the burgeoning natural sciences of his day and sees his philosophy as clearing away for these experimental sciences. Locke is customarily referred to as an empiricist philosopher. Locke held that all of the materials, as he put it, of human knowledge and understanding arise from experience in the form of what he calls ideas. In maintaining this, he aligned himself with some of the leading experimental scientists of his day and firmly against a dominant philosophical doctrine of the time. To see what's distinctive about this approach, it's worth comparing it to what we saw before, particularly in Augustine, where knowledge wasn't about exploring the sensory world around us, because that was shadowy, fleeting, transitory. It was about leaving this world, as Augustine says, on perfect wings, flying to yonder light. But when it comes to John Locke, and particularly his essay concerning human understanding, the contrast really couldn't be greater. Interestingly, he uses two metaphors which explicitly contrast with that classical view of knowledge we've seen previously. He says, all we have now is a candle. Compared to what people thought they had before, the full light of day or divine illumination. He says, all we have now is our legs, rather than wings, rather than flying off to receive some heavenly vision, as far as knowledge is concerned, what we have is our legs to walk around and explore. We cannot leave the cave and ascend to the light. The best we can do is light a candle to dispel a little bit of the darkness. This is a knowledge based on what our senses can tell us about the surroundings through experiments. This is not divine illumination of our minds. He then says, in contrast to Augustine, that with regard to knowledge, we can forget about flying off on angelic wings. We will need to walk around on our own two feet and investigate for ourselves as finite human beings. We're not angels. So as the Enlightenment progressed, the modern world is born, there is clearly less interest in leaving the cave and more interest in investigating it and improving it. To see the contrast between the classical perspective and a modern perspective, let's use our imaginations for a moment. Let's imagine the escapee from Plato's analogy of the cave returning today, rather than going into the cave and seeing this dark, dingy place he left behind. Now he walks into a cave full of light, full of modern technology. He sees experimental sciences exploring and transforming what he left behind before. He sees them demonstrating all they can achieve through modern technology. Now, it was difficult enough before to persuade people to leave the cave for some kind of illumination. How much more difficult would it be now? What makes this job seemingly impossible? is the fact that not only have we developed a different form of knowledge inspired by the scientific method, it has, for many as we've seen, become the only form of knowledge. For example, the 18th century philosopher David Hume 
This empirical form of knowledge, inspired by the natural sciences, became the criteria for judging what is knowledge and what is nonsense. One of the most vivid expressions of this has become known as Hume's Fork. Hume envisages someone looking around some great old library full of ancient literature and books. And they're trying to decide what books to cherish, to keep, to read, and which are vacuous, useless, don't have any genuine knowledge in them at all, and can be literally thrown on the fire, a bonfire and burned. Now, Hume says, what happens when you come across some of that classical literature we've been talking about, some of that scholastic philosophy? Well, you look at it, and it doesn't involve any experimental reasoning or empirical knowledge, and consequently has nothing to offer in the way of genuine knowledge. And you can take that off of the shelf, and you can toss it on the bonfire and watch it burn, because it doesn't have anything genuine to offer us. If we take in our hand any volume, of divinity or school metaphysics for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Of course this sounds reminiscent of the contemporary debate we started with surrounding the new atheists. In fact, in one of those public debates, I remember the scientist who was sceptical about any form of religious belief, saying that the only philosopher he took seriously was David Hume. One of the ironies that's frequently pointed out today is that the very natural sciences that inspired Hume and Locke so much seem to go well beyond their criteria of knowledge and understanding. I mean, just take any of the big questions in cosmology today, it's difficult to see how they could be settled on Hume's approach to knowledge. In fact, it seems as if cosmology is pushing back the boundaries of what constitutes science all the time. One of the most fascinating documentaries I've seen in the last few years asked the interesting question, what happened prior to the Big Bang? It had half a dozen eminent scientists, all with their contrasting and conflicting theories about what happened prior to the Big Bang. Now, it's interestingly, at the end, the documentary pointed out that the kind of passion and commitment they had to their theories reminds one of religious belief. Now, I wonder what David Hume would have made of those different theories. Would he have committed them to the flames? Now, if the contemporary debate about faith and reason with its roots in the kind of empiricism we've been looking at, is not representative of classical Christianity. It's also probably only representative of one tradition within modern philosophy. For example, the Enlightenment came quite late to what we now know as Germany, and the key figures like Kant, Hegel or Schelling were highly critical of the idea you could reduce all knowledge to that scientific paradigm, to what you can put into a test tube, as it were. As much as Kant embraced the Enlightenment and its ideals, he did not see its paradigm for knowledge as altogether liberating. In insisting that the way things are can be reduced to what the natural sciences tell us, he could see a form of imprisonment. A form of imprisonment that denied our humanity as free, moral and religious beings. Ironically, the Enlightenment was making us narrow-minded, producing another restrictive outlook, an inhumane cave of our own making. Kant's revolutionary move was to suggest that the critical reason that was at the heart of the scientific revolution and was admired by so many Enlightenment philosophers was not in fact revealing to us the way things are in themselves. What it was revealing to us is how our minds work, not necessarily how the world works. Now one way to approach this is to think of our minds like some factory processing some raw material. But let's imagine that with this factory all we ever see is the end product coming out of the conveyor belt. We never actually witness 
what the raw material was like coming in at the other end. We never know what that raw material was like because all we've ever seen and witnessed is it the fully processed version. Now, Kant is saying that all human understanding might be like that. It may go through a huge amount of processing and all we ever witness is the end product. Things in space and time, things governed by cause and effect. And that could all be proce the processing of our minds. We never actually know what the raw material was like before that processing happened. In a sense, this, for Kant, is going to turn the tables on the kind of scientific worldview he'd inherited. The new scientific outlook was raising questions concerning our religious and moral convictions, whether they were true to the way things were being discovered by the new sciences. But Kant is saying, we don't know what things are like prior to the processing. We might not be governed by the cause and effect so central to the new sciences. We may be free creatures, the kind of creatures that morality and religion recognises. In fact, our moral convictions may be more true to how things are in themselves than what we can objectify in our cognitive understanding. So for Kant, there was not only the critical reason that it created the mechanistic world cause and effect, there was also another kind of reason, a practical reason, that concerned primarily our ethical deliberations as moral agents. Human beings are moral agents as well as creatures of sense experience. Human experience includes a sense of moral obligation, not subsumed under or explained by sense-bound theoretical reason. Our moral experience, or more precisely, the experience of our morality, impels us to believe in the reality of freedom, which gives us the right to postulate the reality of God and immortality as the ground of moral faith. For according to Kant, our moral ideals are clearly not realised in this world, but look for a world to come where God will vindicate the righteous. I am certain that nothing can shake this belief, since my moral principles would thereby be themselves overthrown, and I cannot disclaim them without becoming abhorrent in my own eyes. So, for many continental philosophers that were inspired by Kant's critic of pure reason, there is more to know than could be put into a test tube. For example, our moral convictions, our aesthetic experience, may point to a broader or deeper reality than the scientific method can grasp. So continental philosophy, following Kant, whether in the form of idealism or romanticism or other more recent trends, has often been critical of confining our human understanding to the way that the natural sciences work. So the contemporary debate we often hear in the media, supposedly between faith and reason, might not be representative of classical Christianity. And it might only be representative of one narrow tradition within modern philosophy. And that tradition itself might not be that in tune with the natural sciences it so admires. So we may have left Plato's dark and dingy cave to a fully illuminated modern world, but at times it can feel just as restricted and benighted when it comes to what counts as knowledge. 